Take care. Here. There we go. Oh, thank you. You guys are great. Okay. All right. It's just I never thought about the breathing part. All right. Let's get started. Um, I'm Mike Wilson. I work at Marantis, uh, like the best company in the world, pretty much. Uh, I've worked there for six months now, so I really have a, a lot of data to draw on, of course. I work as a systems architect. Uh, previously, I uh, worked at other companies. I, I've been working at OpenStack, on OpenStack for about three years, since the, uh, pretty much since Folsom was released. So I've had a chance to do uh, lots of CI/CD exercises, um, both in the context of OpenStack and in somewhat adjacent contexts. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that qualifies me to talk to you guys today about, uh, about CI/CD. Um, just wondering if I could get some audience participation here. How many of you are either have CI/CD in-house or are in the process of implementing it? Put your hands up. Wow. Cool. Um, put your hand down if, well, OK, put your hand back up if you think you've got it complete. Yeah. All right, to you guys that have it complete, um, are you, uh, put your hand up if you're gating, if you're running automated tests, and if you're deploying a full environment for every line of code that you commit. For every line of code that you commit. Well, every commit, I guess. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, how many of you are doing performance testing as part of that, as part of that gate? Anybody doing burn-in before you go into production or burn-in on production? Dang it, you guys are still raising your hands. Well, the point of this exercise was to show how interested people are in CICD, but it's also hopefully to broaden the scope of it a bit. Sometimes when I talk to people about CICD, they think it's a tool set or they think it's a buzzword. Maybe it's something like cloud or, or whatever. So, some other buzzword that doesn't mean a whole lot. So. So I want to tell you in this talk, well, okay, so it's titled How to Take the CI CD Plunge. I just have to apologize. I was going to take this talk in a different direction. So it's subtitled how I, and, or How I Learned to Stop Caring and Love the Bomb for any of you Dr. Strangelove fans. I'll sprinkle the pictures in here. Uh, but other than the amusing pictures, we're not, we're not going to talk a lot about Dr. Strangelove or atomic weaponry. I do want to talk about this. Um, I think I'm going to call this the myth of software delivery. Uh, I'll tell you guys a story, and you might be familiar with it. Um, so a project gets hatched, right? We need something. We need something new. We need something shiny. Maybe it's a feature. Maybe it's an internal-facing service. Um, but this mandate uh, can come from management, or maybe it can come from customers. But what happens is uh, we organize a team around it. Um, maybe we're lucky and we have really elastic infrastructure in our company, so we spin up instances and we start developing. For you lucky guys, that will be the case. Um, and then often what happens is uh, we start doing development. We start going through sprints, um, and we turn out tons of code. And it's awesome, man. We make awesome progress. Uh, we write to the requirements. Uh, we get all the code done, and we say, hey, it's finished. And, and, and while we're doing this, of course, you know, we have the constant project managers and uh, C-level people, and they're checking on it. They want to make sure that we're making progress. All right, this is a constant distraction and a constant motivator slash detractor throughout the whole process. But when we finish up, then we turn it over to operations. And we say, OK, run it. Um, now they get to spend uh, weeks, months, um, or possibly maybe in this stage, we will absolutely fail. Um, but they get to spend all this time trying to make the code that was written that's beautiful, but now they need to make it run on real systems. So I don't think this is an uncommon story. I've witnessed this like so many times during my career. Um, it's a very common, you know, kind of because of this problem it, it, it is why we started talking about agile development. I'm going to talk about that today. But, but, but this is the whole point of my talk. This is, this is the problem that CICD tries to solve. It wants to solve this development all the way through to delivery in one smooth motion. 
So that's it. It's not just a tool set. So what to expect from this presentation? I want to answer this question. Why do we need CI CD? I want to share some stories about how CI CD works in the real world, according to me. Um, and I want to suggest how you can bring CI CD into your projects. I think maybe a better way to say this would be how to bring CI CD into your organization, into your culture. There's the general for the strange love fans. So where do we start? Um, initially, I mean, software development is not that old. We've really only been doing it on, on a large scale for, oh, what, 20, 25 years. And uh, what we were really familiar with when we started doing software development was physical development. So think rockets, think planes. Um, these things are very physical. Uh, they have limits. Uh, they have limits in scope. Whereas in software, uh, we deal with the abstract for the most part. And these slides will be published online, so if, if I click through them before you can take a picture, I'm sorry. So, so from this physical world, we got this development method. Uh, this is commonly referred to as the waterfall method. Um, I like to think of it as a canal with locks. It's a linearly dependent development process. You can't go to the next until you've gone through the first. And mostly I like to think of it that way because it's convenient for my presentation. So. so we started with Waterfall and we realized that was horrible. And so a few years ago, some folks got together at uh, Snowbird, really close to my house. Um, but they didn't ski. They got together and they threw together this thing called the Agile Manifesto. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, the point of the Agile Manifesto is we don't want linearly dependent progress. We want to kind of make this smooth progress, you know? We don't want to be stuck waiting for anything. We want to be able to iterate in very short sprints, uh, get demos out, uh, consume new user stories, keep a backlog, all the good stuff. And for the most part, it works for development. Turns out that people don't care about code. What they care about is running, working software. They want to be able to use it. It doesn't matter that it's beautiful. It doesn't matter that you followed all your sprints and you attended all your scrums. If at the end of the day, we don't have software that's delivered and running, we have failed. Why is this? Business needs to deliver usable product quickly and repeatedly. So I, I, I couldn't pull together the, the actual data or, or find some source for this. But I, I do know that waterfall project completion time, the average is in years, all right? Uh, that's completion. That means failure, because by that time, someone's already taken over and developed your features. Your customer doesn't care, or he's moved on. So CI, CD is how we can take these ideas, put them through this process, this assembly line of development and deployment, and we want to do this reliably, repeatedly, and with very short time to market, as short a time as possible. So this, I think this is part of the solution, or at least the beginnings of the solution to the myth of software delivery that I talked about earlier. So again, like I described earlier, releasing software is the job of system administrators. Um, and that's bad, because system administrators are really bad at, I mean, they're really good at making things run. I'm a system administrator, by the way, full disclosure. That's my background. They're good at making things run, but they're not good at uh, designing software. So they implement these heinous hacks. They do these horrible things to make things run. And, and it turns out that, um, again, full disclosure, software or system administrator, developers really suck at writing software for real environments. They tend to stay in the abstract, and they're good at that. But when it comes to running things, they want, oh, it's your job, not my job. So, so we have agile development for the most part, but we have waterfall operations. This is, this is how DevOps started. You know, this is what the whole movement is all about. This is sysadmins that know how to be developers, or at least collaborate with developers, and developers that know how to run stuff. So just remember, going back those, those, few, uh, those few slides where we talked about waterfall, this is a linearly dependent process. I can't move on until I finish this first one. We have this in operations. <laughs> Uh, there we go. Okay. By the way, I'm going to have a time for questions and comments later. Um, 
So if you're burning to say something or discredit me or argue, we, we can do that. So here's kind of an overview of continuous integration. I pulled this off of Wikipedia. I don't think this is a big mystery at this point. We have lots of folks that are doing it successfully. Um, central code repository, version tracking, code repository, automate the build, make the build self-testing. Everyone commits to the build every day. Every commit to the build, to the baseline should be built. We keep that build fast. We test in a, a clone of the production environment. We make it easy to get the latest deliverables. Everyone can see the results of the latest build. It's transparent, you know, so we know what broke it. And uh, this last piece right here is automate deployment. This is the tricky piece. This leads us into continuous delivery, which I don't think is as well defined. We do know that it has a dependency on CI because we have to have all those automated regression tests. Um, a delivery pipeline, the idea of it, again, think back to the canal with locks, it flows. There are no stops in it. Um, I know many of you out here are going to think, well, that's, that's totally unrealistic. You know, we have, we have SLAs, we have customers. This isn't ideal, and I've never actually gotten to the full CD where I can deploy any time. But, but this is the goal. This is where we want to get. And I think to get there, you know, we need lots of logging. We need lots of real-time data analysis, metrics, monitoring. We need to automate all these things that we're doing manually. Um, and build those into actual systems. <laughs> so, hey, this is Slim Pickens riding the bomb down, um, and we're going to move into some tales from the field. <laughs> so I want to talk about uh, a, a company that I worked out that used to build a whole lot of custom RPMs. Uh, they were a company that operated at, at the scale of thousands, um, and it was really important for them to customize certain packages. So let's say Apache, the Linux kernel, PHP, um, a lot of quota tools. I mean, they customize all kinds of things. We had custom packages that we maintained, at least in the tens. Um, so we had all these custom RPMs floating around. And how this would work is we would build them, someone would build them, and maybe on their workstation, maybe on a build machine. The specs kind of ended up in random places. Uh, you know, usually we could check with, you know, we knew, we knew, for example, that I had built the, uh, the Power DNS RPM, so we could always talk with Mike um, about where the spec was. The problem was, uh, <laughs> you know, we could lose code, uh, we could lose patches. Uh, there wouldn't be good comments with that code if we could find it. I couldn't remember why did I patch that thing that way, right? Um, often, if I'm going to write a patch, I'm not really going to write a test in that patch set. I'm just going to write the patch, um, and of course, we had this. We would deploy the RPM in production. We'd try it on a box, two, three, four. And, man, that worked great. Let's, let's blow it out everywhere. And, and then things would break. So we wanted to get away from this. So our goal was to know where the specs in the code are. That should be tracked, version controlled, have all the history around it. We wanted to be able to reliably build the same RPMs uh, the same way all the time. Um, we wanted to have confidence that it wasn't going to break the platform. And yeah, all the change history well known and all the events of rolling out and building, we wanted that to be broadcasted. So this is a mini, a, a mini CI CD process that we started. This is not, this doesn't involve, you'll notice it doesn't involve any Garrett, it doesn't involve any code analysis tools. It's really simple. But it worked out pretty well, so I wanted to share it. So what we would do is we set up a couple Git repositories. We had a code repository, and we had an RPM spec repository. By the way, everybody knows what an RPM spec is. I'll, I'll just explain that really quick. So a, a, a spec, you can think of it as that's the data that the RPM build tool or mock or whatever RPM builder you have. That's the data it's going to use to produce the artifact, which is the RPM. RPM is the Red Hat uh, package management system, um, basically how you install software. You can think of it as one of the little things that you download from CNET or whatever, it's like an exe file, you can use it to install software. So the spec was, uh, was all the information that was needed uh, for how to build the software. It described the sources, it described the patches, it described the files contained within the build, um, any pre, post, all those things needed to, without going into much more detail, to install the package and to build the package. So that spec would be authored and it would be checked into a Git repo. 
the code that that patch affected, that that spec affected, would also be kept in a Git repo. Remember I said before, sometimes we would just keep the tar GZs around somewhere. It was really important to keep the code in the repo. That gave us a commit history and really gave us some continuation of, uh, you know, it just gave us a history of where things were going. Then we set up Jenkins in a very simplistic way. Jenkins would pull on both the code repo and the spec repo. And when a change was detected in either of those repositories, it would check the code out. Um, the tests live together with the code repo. So another thing that I might add is when you added a patch, you were required to add tests, functional and unit. And that was invoked as the first stage. Um, and this was done, let's see here. Yeah, this was done on a new, on a new machine, on a new virtual machine that would spin up. It would essentially be like a CentOS something or other. You know, 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, whatever we were using at the time. Wow, this got messed up. Um, so mock is an RPM build builder. It was what we actually used to build our RPMs. Um, so it would be invoked as a second stage. And an RPM would be produced. <coughs> and this was also done on a new machine, a vanilla machine. So at this point, hopefully, we got a successful RPM. We got a little bit of metadata out of the build. Uh, for example, we may have added files. Uh, we almost always had a change to the change log to add so we could, so our operators could, uh, could understand you know, why the version changed. Um, and, and if that happened, you know, we'd automatically commit those changes to the spec and then make sure that Jenkins didn't get into an infinite loop because another, um, another change had happened to the spec repo. So that was the second stage. The third stage is we'd spin up a new machine and we would actually install the RPM. Then we would smoke test, you know, run the command ls. Ooh, that didn't break. Wonderful. Very basic tests. Um, as a fourth stage, we would create, uh, we, we used, uh, I, I don't think yum repo is quite the right word, but uh, an RPM repo we would create uh, as part of the fourth stage. We would sign the RPM with our key. <coughs> We'd upload it to the repo. Spin up another new machine. We would install from the yum re repo as the fifth stage, and we would perform smoke testing again. So notice I'm all these things that we have to do to install a package, I'm isolating, I'm doing them individually, and I'm gathering data at every stage. So the sixth stage was to install the whole platform. So I'd get all my custom RPMs, all my custom configuration, <coughs> I'd throw it onto a VM, and I'd install this RPM from the yum repo, um, and then I'd run functional tests on the whole platform, and that was a more comprehensive test suite. So that would, uh, that would test functional things, and it would also test interactions. Um, so for example, let's say I had some, you know, I had, well, let's say I had a LAMP uh, application that was running on my platform. And that's going to involve all kinds of things. That's Linux, Apache, uh, PHP. What does the M stand for? I should know this. MySQL, thank you. <laughs> so that would run through the, the whole gamut of our, uh, of our custom packages, because by the way, all those were custom. And it would test and make sure that the application worked. And it would do that with all these things that we would deploy on our platform. And when all the things worked, we said, oh, OK, we, we feel pretty good about deploying this to production. We, we feel like we've done what we can to make sure that it's reliable and that it's high quality. At that point, it was published to a list of official released repos. <coughs> so how this works is um, there were some packages that could just get auto-updated. Um, they weren't of too high of impact. Um, and in that case, auto update would come along at night and it would just install them. Um, and we would trust our monitoring and metrics infrastructure to, to you know, as our last fail safe. But, but we were confident at that point. Um, the other case was we had a set of sensitive RPMs like the kernel. We just, we didn't want to just install kernels whenever. So we would actually go through a slow roll process and, and we would do that through Puppet. So. So that's kind of the end there. Um, I actually, I should stop and ask questions. Does anybody have questions about this process? Is there anything I under didn't explain or explain too quickly? If you have questions, there's a mic here, there's a mic there. You can raise your hand. OK. I'm going to move on to scenario two. So this is probably one that people are, uh, are interested here at the OpenStack Summit, you know? We're all about OpenStack. So, so 
We did. I, I have, in fact, managed a, a really large open, a large open stack cloud, and we did, in fact, have to upgrade it multiple times. And this is super painful, um, especially at large scale. I see. Well, I saw some people from Rackspace back here earlier. They they know what I'm talking about. Anybody who has tried to upgrade OpenStack with running workloads knows it's uh, incredibly not tailored to this process. So I am not saying this is a complete solution, but I think this is a good example of continuous delivery. I think this is a good example of the direction that we should be going. There's lots of things that you'll notice here um, of places where the process could have been improved more or automated more. Um, so first of all, See that last story for how we made RPMs? Uh, our policy was that anything that we installed in our OpenStack cloud, anything that made up the platform, was an RPM. That was software. Anything that was configuration was part of a puppet manifest. Um, so essentially, what we had is we had a snapshot of all the packages that should be installed and of all the configurations that should be in place. Those were in puppet manifests, and we would tag that. We would tag it something like Allen or whatever. We'd just name the release, and that was production. All right, so once that was tagged, I mean, that was tagged, actually, at the time that we release. But that tag was around. Uh, then, then generally, we would have a new set of puppet manifests, and this was uh, in a branch, and this represented the delta between production and what we wanted to roll out. Um, so those would be in their own branch. And then we also had a separate CI process for the puppet manifest, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not really going to go into that for uh, lack of time. <coughs> so then what we would do is we had uh, two puppet clusters. The puppet clusters were identical. They were infrastructure that was really easy to spin up. Um, so we could, I mean, we could produce 1,000 puppet clusters as long as we had the hardware. That was a really uh, awesome automated process. But we would have puppet cluster A and Puppet cluster B, and you can think of these as A being production and B being the code that we wanted to move to. So production manifests for Puppet were an A. The new manifests we would deploy to Puppet cluster B. Um, right. So initially, Puppet cluster B would have no hosts that it was managing. Puppet cluster A would have them all, including production. So we have a staging environment. And a staging environment encompassed all of the bare metal that we needed to run an OpenStack cloud. Had all the essential infrastructure in there. And uh, what we would do is we would take um, the staging environment and we would add it to Puppet Cluster A. What this caused was an install of OpenStack from bare metal. That would kick off the process. So we'd install OpenStack, we'd get it configured, we'd get it all spun up. And at this point, um, we'd be able to run regret. Oh, whoops. Oh, yep, I should switch slides. So at this point, we'd be able to run um, a modified Tempest with some of our custom stuff in it, plus any additional testing that we had. <coughs> we'd run that against, um, against the staging environment. Remember, the staging environment had been installed by cluster A, which was the current code. <coughs> I probably should have made a graphic for this, but... Uh. Okay, when those tests would pass, and we had high confidence that it was all working, we would wipe staging, um, take it back to bare metal that doesn't have anything on it. We would take staging out of cluster A and add it to cluster B. This meant that we would install OpenStack from cluster B, for, so from the new code from the ground up. So that would happen, and hopefully it would work. And at the end, we were, again, we're going to run Tempest. We're going to run all our integration tests, and, and hopefully that all worked. That's great. So when that was done, we would wipe the staging environment again. We would add the staging environment to A, which means it would get the current code. And then what we would do is we would do a slow roll process. So we would we had a in staging we had a, a couple controllers, a couple computes, a couple, you know, there are all these pieces of infrastructure that are hopefully n plus 1. We would take pieces of those and we would move them over into the puppet cluster for B. Um, so this is, this is the hard part. Um, the puppet manifests uh, are supposed to describe how an upgrade happens from A to B. So they would do their magic at this point. It wasn't a bare metal install, it was an upgrade. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I could talk, like, I could do a whole talk on just this right here, because this was very, um, very case dependent. 
uh, depended on what we were upgrading, how we were upgrading, if we were changing settings, if we were doing schema migrations. You know, a lot of different things were done here. And sometimes Puppet wasn't used. Puppet is not like really a great tool for all these things. Um, so sorry, I mean, maybe I can give another talk about those details, but, but that's essentially what happened. So we would move all the hosts from A to B, which would upgrade them. And at the very end, uh, while this was happening, uh, this is the non-automated step. We'd watch logs, we'd watch metrics, and we'd watch for any failures in the automated tests. Um, if we didn't notice anything bad, and we didn't pick up anything from our automated tests or from our monitoring that was bad, um, then we thought we were successful. We thought we'd actually done an upgrade. So the last step, as we throw away staging, we don't need it anymore. Um, and we have a performance environment that we now add to the B Puppet cluster. So that'll install OpenStack from scratch. Uh, the performance environment had some of our, let's say some of our um, redundant network equipment, some of our storage equipment, um, you know, that actually cared about performance metrics. And then we would hammer the crap out of it to make sure that we didn't induce, introduce any performance uh, regressions. If this worked, finally, that whole A to B process that I described in staging, we would do in production. And again, the non-automated part is us sitting there watching the logs, monitoring things very carefully. Uh, and if at any point things break, you know, we, we were usually rolling back immediately. Um, so again, let me stop and field any questions. I, I, this can be confusing. Go for it. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. All right, let me see if I can summarize your question. So your 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 first question okay. So your second question is what do I have to do to um what kind of measures do I have to take to provide for an upgrade? Is that is that right or no, Mm -hmm. Oh, if you fail at any point in this process, if any of these, if any of these tests fail, so if any of the tests fail, then we stop. We go back to the drawing board and we start developing. We figure out what broke, okay. and we fix it. Like the ultimate driver of our process is that we're passing these tests. Okay. Right. Same thing. If we deploy in production and we discovered we failed, we we rewrite more tests. We write more automation. Sorry. Okay. Did that cover both of your questions? So um, this upgrade process, so the RPM process is obviously really quick. I mean, this happens within 10 minutes. Uh, this process right here, it all happens pretty quickly up until the, the watching the logs part. Uh, this is the part where we have to have a human online to sit there and accompany it. And depending, it, it really depends on the upgrade, but, but I'd say that's, that's an hour or two of somebody's time. Cause, just because we lack automation. Okay, um, going through the whole process all the way to production. You know, I, that, so starting to get pr to production. So let me just disclaim, first of all, this is, this is at 20,000 nodes. So starting to get to production, that would usually take about a day. Um, rolling it to the rest of the cluster, <coughs> the rest of the week. Pretty much. We would try and start it on a Monday and get it done like on a Wednesday and then watch it Thursday and watch it Friday. But ideal, but does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? They were kind of arbitrary. Um, the performance testing suite was based on problems that we had seen. So every time we saw a problem, we'd craft a test for it. Um, but it, other than that, it's just kind of your usual thing that you would think of. Uh, we would generate load and throw it at APIs. Uh, we would generate load and throw it at the messaging system. Um, we would generate, you know, disk activity, uh, do some basic VM benchmarking. Um, there were lots of things that we didn't think of. 
but yeah. Um, have you are you familiar with Rally? So Rally in the OpenStack case is an OpenStack benchmarking uh, project. We didn't have that back when we did this, but Rally is a really good place to start, I think. Yeah, you have to. Absolutely have to at 20,000 nodes. If you don't, it's death. Yes, for sure. At scale, this, so here's something I learned um, just going from like managing tens and hundreds of nodes to thousands. This is so important at scale. When you scale, like this is, I, I feel like you have to do this or you die. We had dedicated, we had dedicated bare metal um, for the staging and the performance environment. Is that? But I mean, for example, OpenStack Community CI will spin up virtual machines. Um, I think for performance testing, especially, I would use bare metal. I don't think you should use virtual machines. That doesn't make sense. That's not apples to apples. Any other questions? Oh, okay, so I should clarify. Um, so this whole process right here, this this wasn't necessarily run on every commit. This is part of the deployment pipeline. I'm sorry. This is part of the deployment pipeline. This would essentially happen on a release event. And and we, we would categorize the release events into two categories. We had non-trivial, which is kind of just what it sounds like. We're like, oh. They changed documentation, they changed a few lines of code. We don't think this is going to affect anything. Roll it out. Go, go, go. And that was more of a run it through these environments very quickly. Don't look at the logs so much. Just get it out there. And that, that wasn't really a slow roll. We would do that pretty quickly. So that could be done in a day, two, three. Um, and the non-trivial was what, what went through this process. And this happened once a month. OK, any other questions? Yeah. It has to be running for all the time. Uh, when we had more nodes, anyways, a new scalability issue came up. Uh, mm -hmm. We never tested it before, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there are, I mean, that's been in discussion in the community a lot. Um, that's Rally, the, the benchmarking thing that I mentioned earlier, was specifically crafted with that in mind. Um, so we do run Rally um, in some gates. I believe in the Neutron gates, we run Rally currently. Um, and the plan is to move it to more of the gates for OpenStack. Um, but getting a performance environment set up and getting <coughs> parameters, you know, like a baseline established and tracked between releases. Um, I've, I've personally talked about it with a couple other people. I don't, I don't know of anything really organized that's going on. But if everybody's interested in it. Um, <laughs> that's all about all I can say about that. Anything else? All right, let me just uh, cover the last, okay, gotchas. I, I, I guess I went over a lot of gotchas. Um, so this process I described is not really great for when you change fundamental things about your cloud. Uh, this is kind of a weakness of CICD is that you build on a baseline. Uh, when you change network technology, storage technology, whatever, you just need to be really careful. Um, build this testing discipline into your organization, build this um, pre-architecture uh, kind of mindset where we expect to know how things will perform. We expect to know the defined behaviors, you know, how this, how this will change things. And you've got to write tests accordingly. This should be built into your CI, but it can be harder, right? And there's also this issue of uh, DB uh, database schema migrations that we talk about in OpenStack all the time. 
I'll just say the way that we did it is we did kind of a um, kind of like the Procona toolkit does online schema changes, where you put triggers in and you have copies of tables and you have two databases. That's kind of how we did it. I just want to point out that's no rollback option if you do that. It's only roll forward. If something breaks, you're committed to fix it. So I'll just go over those real quick. Uh, Toolchain, I'm going to gloss over this. You guys can look at other OpenStack projects. You can look at these slides afterwards. I don't really care what you use. Um, Jenkins is great. Garrett is great. Uh, there are all kinds of cool automation tools, stuff built in OpenStack, CloudStack, Docker, Couchbase, Android. Go look at them and figure out what's useful for you, and don't be afraid uh, to innovate there. The last, the last thing I want to talk about is culture. I want to say I think this is actually probably the most important part of CI/CD. Um, I can't talk about it first because then more people would have left. It's kind of like the bad news of CI/CD. It's what like managers don't want to hear. It's what organization people don't want to hear. But it's so important, and without the cultural change, it's really not going to work. So take a look at this table. We have three types of organizations. By the way, I stole this out of the 2014 State of DevOps report by Puppet Lab, so go get that. That's really cool. But these three types of organizations are pathological, a power-oriented organization, bureaucratic, which is a rule-oriented organization, and generative, which is performance-oriented. Take about 20 seconds, look at those, and decide which one you are in. All right. So the better one is the generative one, obviously. It looks a lot better. No messengers killed. Um, and that's really what we're aiming for with the DevOps culture and the CI CD culture. The whole point of this process is to eliminate functional silos. We do not want dev and ops and QA and security and performance. That doesn't work. What that does is a lot of, he did it, she did it, they did it, they didn't tell me, I didn't, no one told me. It's, it's a lot of blame, right? There's no shared responsibility. We chuck it over the fence. Um, this is where all the badness in development comes from, is this, separate, this separation of functional silos. The ideal situation is that we have a nice team that has a security person, it has a QA person, it has a dev, it has, a, it has an operator. It has all these, uh, you know, it's a multidiscipline team. It's cross-functional and it works together to produce things. And these are small teams. Uh, observe the two pizza roll, please. <coughs> they have shared responsibility. When something breaks, it's not a person's fault, it's everybody's fault. They have high cooperation. Failure is expected. It's part of the experience. We live to fix failure. Um, the whole point of this is to empower people. Empower people will actually solve problems. People that are whipped will just wait around. Well, they don't want the blame. So the point is we have to produce software that works for users. Everyone has that responsibility. One of the important things about this kind of culture is when you go into postmortems, and you should be having them often, you are wanting to fix the process, not finding to someone to blame. Now, I want to point out, it may, in fact, be someone's fault, right? Like that Mike guy, how he uh, lost his PowerDNS patches, and he didn't know why he wrote them in the first place. That was definitely my fault. But it was the system's fault that allowed me to do that, right? That's, that's where the failure uh, should be identified. The solution was, hey, we don't deploy any of Mike's RPMs unless he's committed them into the repo and he's built them using the official build process. That is the solution. Um, another thing we're trying to foster in this kind of culture is cross-functional cooperation. That means empathy. It's like empathy, business, that, what is, I don't, we're, we're here to make money. No, we are here to make money. But empathy generates this shared responsibility, this sense of team, right? this sense of everyone is responsible, everyone is going to do what they can to make sure the product is delivered. Um, last slide, I'll go over it really quickly. <coughs> when you talk to your managers and you talk to your C-level, when you start implementing CI-CD for your new features, um, it's going to look like you're taking maybe 20 to 30% more time writing all this test stuff and spinning up all this new frameworks. Um, I want to point out that it's going to look like that. It's going to appear that way. The reason why is because we're spending this time 
um, that we're going to spend anyway scrambling, we're spending it in a proactive way. We're spending it at the beginning instead of at the end when we fail or in the middle where we fail. But, but we need to be aware of that and we need to be able to plan for it and socialize that idea in our organizations. And you're also, if you're implementing this right in the middle of something, you're gonna have a huge backlog of missing coverage. That's essential to get this stuff on the development schedule. Um, we can't have CICD for half the things. We need it for all the things. Uh, yeah, that's it. I actually don't have any time uh, left, so if you have questions, come meet me outside, but, but thank you very much. <laughs>